Okay, I think we'll get started. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the European <coughs> Studies program here at the center, as well as the History and Public Policy program. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this book discussion with Professor Robert Wistrich, author of A Lethal Obsession, Anti-Semitism, um, and anti-Semitism from antiquity to the global jihad, as well as Jeff Herf, uh, our colleague at the University of Maryland. I'll be introducing both of them, them shortly. Let me just uh, tell those of you who are not familiar with the center that the center was established by an act of Congress in 1968. It's the nation's official living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, was founded to honor and build upon his legacy as a man who bridged the divide between scholarship and public policy. And that's what we do. We bring together the thinkers and the doers, policymakers, scholars, business leaders, in the hope and the belief that a frank and open dialogue will lead to better understanding, cooperation, and public policy. Today's book discussion very much fits fits this mission, and um, I'm delighted uh, that you can all join us for this session, which is um, uh, done, organized in cooperation with several other programs here, uh, but let me uh, extend a special thank you to my colleague Sonia Michel uh, at the U.S. Studies Program, uh, who was instrumental in this, uh, bringing about this event. Uh, this event will be webcast live, uh, so uh, uh, for that reason I'd like to ask you later on the discussion period to wait until uh, you have the microphone. And um, now let me introduce our two speakers. Professor Robert Wistrich has had a, a most distinguished career uh, in academia. He is currently the director of the Vidal Sasson International Center for the Study of Anti-Semitism and Neuburger Professor of European and Jewish History at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He is really one of the, uh, the leading experts on anti-Semitism. Prior to joining the university in 1982, Dr. Wistrich served as director of research at the Institute of Contemporary History and the Wiener Library in London. Between 1991 and 1995, he was appointed chair of Jewish, Jewish Studies at the University College London. He has held a number of important other positions. Between 1999 and 2001, he was one of six scholars appointed to an international Catholic Jewish historical commission to examine the wartime record of Pope Pius XII. In June 2003, he initiated and, in fact, acted as chief historical advisor to a BBC documentary on contemporary Muslim anti-Semitism entitled Blaming the Jews. Since 2003, he has served as editor of the research journal Anti-Semitism Anti -Semitism Internationalism and the Posen Papers in Contemporary Anti-Semitism. He's a prolific author, has written extensively on the history of anti-Semitism, Jews, socialism, Nazi Germany, and related topics. He's the author of a number of award-winning uh, books, including Socialism and the Jews, The Jews of Vienna in the Age of Franz Joseph, and Anti-Semitism, The Longest Hatred. His latest book, which we'll be talking about today, A Lethal Obsession, Anti-Semitism from Antiquity to Global Jihad, was just published this month. It's hot off the press, and it examines the evolution uh, of anti-Semitism anti through the various stages of history. We have the great pleasure to welcome back to the Wilson Center as our distinguished commentator for this se session, Professor Jeffrey Herf. He is professor of modern European history at the University of Maryland, and I'm proud to say a former Wilson Center fellow. 
He has lectured widely at major universities and research centers in the United States, Europe, and Israel. He's really one of the leading European historians of this country. He has published a host of um, uh, articles and books, a number of um, contributions to major newspapers in this country and in Germany. Uh, he has written a number of very important books, including Divided Memory, The Nazi Past in the Two Germanies, War by Other Means, Soviet Power and West German Resistance and the Battle of the Euro Missiles, and Reactionary Modernism, Technology, Culture, Politics in Weimar and the Third Reich. His most recent book, Nazi Propaganda for the Arab World, examines the Nazi regime's efforts to spread its ideas to North Africa and the Middle East during World War II. So we've had the pleasure to uh, launch uh, this book here at a session in December. That This most recent volume is a sequel to his book, The Jewish Enemy, Nazi Propaganda During World War II and the Holocaust, which won the National Jewish Book Award for work on the Holocaust and was the subject of his research here at the center. So a terrific panel. I'm thrilled to have um, to, to now be able to turn over the floor to Professor Wistley and then over to Jeff. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It is an honor for me to be here for the first time at the Woodrow Wilson Center and particularly on this occasion because indeed Today, the 5th of January, is the official first day of publication of this book. And this is such a distinguished institution and one that has a special concern with international affairs. I find that appropriate because although at first glance for many people, the subject, the topic of this study of mine might not appear to be related to international politics, anyone who will take the time to examine it closely will see that in an almost infinite variety of unexpected ways, it is very closely related. Before I came here last week, I went to the university library, of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, uh, because I wanted to inform the librarian that he should order a copy for the library. We have interesting librarians uh, at our institution. He asked me, when is it coming out? I said the 5th of January 2010. And I swear I am repeating his word-for-word -word reply. He said, that is... 115 years to the day since the famous ceremony or notorious ceremony in the Ecole Militaire in Paris when Alfred Dreyfus was stripped of his military insignia, marched around the military school humiliated to cries of death to the traitor, death to the Jews, one of the seminal moments of modern anti-Semitism and one which had far-reaching consequences. One road leading, so to speak, to Auschwitz, if we stretch a point, and the other leading to the establishment of the State of Israel, since one of the observers of that humiliating degradation ceremony was Theodor Herzl, an Austrian journalist, who was reporting on these events in Paris at the time. So the 5th of January, it so happens, 115 years ago today, witnessed that scene. I should also say that, uh, and this is just uh, by the way, I arrived late last night, close to midnight in Washington, D.C., on a flight from Heathrow, airport in London and witnessed at first hand something that is now in all the news media uh, as I noticed this morning namely airplane security, airport security. This 
has nothing ostensibly to do with the subject of our discussion tonight, and yet, like so many other things, it does. Because when we start to examine the deeper reasons why so many airline passengers around the world are being subjected, and will be even more in the coming year and years to come, to the kind of, uh, <clears throat> I would say, nightmarish, uh, and it was quite nightmarish, the proceedings last night at Heathrow, um, examinations, at the end of the day, it is all connected with the ongoing struggle or clash of civilizations, quote unquote, I'm not taking a pos position on that right now, the war between, the war, quote unquote, between Islam and the West, and one of the features of my book, which I go into at considerable length, is the way in which not only the state of Israel, but the Jewish people as a people find themselves once more on the front line, whether they wish it to be so or not, of much larger historical forces and their fate and the fate of civilization may well be closely entwined as has happened on a number of occasions in the past. Let me recount to you a joke which I heard in London, which I think epitomizes, encapsulates the peculiar kind of response today in many parts of the world to Israelis and directly or indirectly to Jews. A guy in Paris sees a pit bull attacking a toddler, a small child. He kills the pit bull and saves the child's life. Reporters rush to interview this hero. And they say, tell us, what is your name? All Paris will love you. Tomorrow's headline will be, Parisian hero saves girl from vicious dog. The guy says, but I'm not from Paris. So I say, never mind. That's okay. The whole of France will love you. And the headline will be, French hero saves girl from vicious dog. And so it goes on. He says, he's not from France. They say, all Europe will love you. And then finally, the guy says, look, I'm not from Europe. So where are you from? He says, I'm from Israel. So what do the reporters say? Okay, tomorrow's headlines will proclaim to the world, Israeli kills girl's dog. <laughs> the chief rabbi of Britain said a few years ago something which I think deserves to be quoted, it's short, it's pithy. He said, German Nazism came and went. European fascism came and went. Soviet communism came and went. Anti-Semitism came and stayed. The only thing I might question in that formulation is the time dimension. Because one of my arguments, and it's not new in this book, is that anti-Semitism, and it's a term I coined actually 20 years ago, is the longest hatred. The longest hatred in the sense that if you look at the broad sweep of history, there is no other human hatred I can think of for a specific group of people that has been so persistent, so ubiquitous, or near ubiquitous, so intense, albeit sometimes ambivalent and mixed with admiration and other complex sentiments, and so protean, 
so adaptable, so able to adjust itself to the zeitgeist, to the spirit of the age. And that demands of the historian, I think, a different sort of approach from the more conventional one that we find in many disciplines, be they sociology, uh, psychoanalysis, uh, anthropology, political science, international relations, and so on and so forth. And even historians today have, I think, an unfortunate tendency to assume that because the term itself, anti-Semitism, is a modern term, and of course, in some ways, illogical and questionable, although the phenomenon it describes is real, to assume that anti-Semitism itself is essentially a modern phenomenon. That is fine as far as it goes, but it doesn't go very far, because my contention would be, and I think that I have made the case um, in this book and in, in some earlier works, that without an awareness of the many layers of hostility or antagonism or, or opposition uh, to Jews through the centuries, albeit they assume different forms and different manifestations across cultures, between different societies, that without those layers, one cannot understand those aspects of anti-Semitism we think we know, we believe that we are familiar with, which date back essentially to the 19th and the 20th centuries. Anti-Semitism has deep roots. And I don't have the time, the space of 20 minutes uh, to enumerate all those I can do no more for the sake of stimulating discussion here today than provide some glimpses of themes that I've tried to flesh out in great detail and in a documented way, in a scholarly way, in my book. Clearly, I think that the Christian sediment, the roots of Jew hatred, negation of Judaism, uh, negation ultimately of the Jewish people as a people, do go back, even if they do not necessarily originate in the early centuries of the Christian era. I would say particularly between the fourth and sixth centuries with the patristic writings, the writings of the church fathers. Uh, that is the time where the synagogue itself to a certain extent, is already demonized. The synagogue of Satan. And some of the great saints of the Christian church are among the, the, the preachers of hatred. St. John Chrysostom for the uh, Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, or St. Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, who actually justified in the year 380 the burning down of a synagogue in a Greco-Roman city in northern Syria because he argued that the synagogue is a den of betrayal and godlessness. And one could go on multiplying, as other historians have done, uh, the long story, a terrible story in many ways, of the ways in which Christianity, in all its various branches, um, over the centuries, despite or perhaps because it grew out of the matrix of Judaism, came in the course of time to negate, to negate that point of origin. Christian anti-Semitism, however, since World War II, and particularly in the last 40 years, while I would not describe it as a spent force, is certainly not the force that it once was. And the baton, if I can use that sporting expression, has passed. Passed to a considerable degree from the Christian world to the Muslim world. 
just as it has increasingly tended to move from the political right to the polit political left, largely through the impact of anti-Zionism and antagonism towards Israel, and I'm not right now going to go into the question of the justification or lack of justification for this, but this has brought the left to become more of a source of anti-Jewish feeling, even if not always motivated by anti-Semitism as we traditionally understand it. When I say the right and the left, of course I'm fully aware these are very broad and sweeping terms and in my book obviously I will go, go into the differentiations that are necessary. When I discuss the communist world, of course that is uh, perhaps fortunately no longer with us, but uh, the communist world played its role in the metamorphosis of anti-Semitism after the Shoah, both in uh, the Soviet Union and in the East European countries under communist rule. And the left was influenced by that. There are parts of the left that were not infected and even today are not. Nevertheless, there is a clear shift. The conservative right on the whole is far, strikes me as far, far more likely to be understanding or sympathetic to the dilemmas of Israel and closer in some ways to the values, perhaps this is less true of the United States and here there's an element of American exceptionalism, but in the rest of the world closer to uh, the values of the moderate right than was the case in the past. When I look at the, the particularly troubling aspects of anti-Semitism that drove me almost in some way forced me to write this book. That's a strong term I realize, but I think that the turning point for me was really 2001. The idea of writing a major work on this subject I certainly had had 20 years ago so that the actual point of origin could go back 20 years. But at that time in the period of transition 1989-1991 with the coming down of the Berlin Wall, the fall of communism, there was a revival of a very, very different kind of anti-Semitism much of it focused more in Central and Eastern Europe. Of course, at the time when I made a film that was eventually became a PBS film called The Longest Hatred and wrote a book of that title, I was fully aware of the importance and centrality of the Arab and Muslim world. But it had not yet achieved the acuity that seems to me overwhelming since the turn of the millennium and really after a period of the 1990s where without suggesting that anti-Semitism declined or, or was on the point of disappearing although there were people including in the United States who wrote as if we are about to see the demise of anti-Semitism I do remember such articles um, nevertheless it was relatively quiescent compared with what we have seen since the year 2000-2001. There are trigger events. They are not anything more than the outward catalysts, but they are in many senses obvious. The second intifada, Palestinian intifada, that began in the closing months of the year 2000. Obviously the side effects and fallout of uh, the events of 9-11. There was the Durban conference just before 
which was a very significant event in retrospect, and some people grasp its importance at the time. The Iraq War also, although it had no ostensible immediate direct connection, had significant fallout in acting as a catalyst for um, strong feelings that mixed together in the larger world, anti-Americanism, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. And I devoted a chapter to that theme in my book, and it's also pervasive in other sections. The imagery, the language of anti-Semitism that has come out of the Muslim world has also escalated. It's not new. One can find, and I trace all the antecedents from the 1920s and 30s. Of course, we can go right back to the Quran, Muhammad's war with the Jews. I mention all these things, but these were things that were largely instrumentalized by a fundamentalist or political Islam, radicalized, selectively used, but with devastating and le lethal consequences that we are living in many other areas today. The jihad or the global jihad, which is a war on the West and against the West, but in which, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on which particular section of the jihadi movement we're looking at, there is a strong anti-Jewish component. Rarely addressed in the international media, but it is there. And neglected. And much of its imagery and ferocity clearly strikes and uh, echoes with those of us and Jeffrey Huff and I belong to a certain uh, number of scholars who have come at this problem f more through the prism of European history and particularly Central European history. But we see the repetition, the revival of almost zoological images of Jews and a language that I can only describe with all due restraint as potentially genocidal. A language that dehumanizes, that presents not only Israelis as Nazis, which is something that unfortunately we increasingly find in mainstream Western uh, media, but far beyond that, which presents Jews as such, in the way that we have been used to seeing in Nazi uh, caricatures, in Nazi uh, language, the Jews as the conspirators who seek to control and dominate the world, the Jews who dominate the United States, Jews as predators, Jews as um, bloodthirsty exploiters and oppressors who control the international financial system, the media, the lying, deceptive, rapacious Jew, Jews who seek to destroy, in this case, the world of Islam or uh, the Arab world. This is a language that's familiar from European, modern European anti-Semitism and which has been adopted, which has been appropriated, has been, I would say, even internalized, so that it has become second nature. And this is something we hear relatively little about, and yet it has slowly come to corrupt, in my view, some of the perceptions of Jews in the Western world. To put it in a slightly simplistic, but nonetheless to me, um, appropriate way, to the extent that European and even Nazi anti-Semitism was exported to uh, the Arab world in uh, the 1930s and 40s, which is the subject of Jeffrey Huff's excellent book. But of course, it had to be ready, that world had to be ready to absorb, to absorb that product, 
Today we have seen, through at least the beginnings of a process by which that anti-Semitism is re-exported back to the Western world. Sometimes through direct, sometimes through indirect means. Sometimes through the effects of a Muslim diaspora, which in Europe is reached to 25 million at a conservative estimate. And it is sufficient that there is a minority, an activist extreme minority, which is dedicated to, as part of its jihadi worldview, to spreading this type of anti-Semitism, which is what it does, as a result of all that, inevitably there are side effects, there are consequences, even though they are complex. And I have certainly no interest or intention to start demonizing uh, the Muslim world in this respect. I'm fully aware of the fact that there are millions of law-abiding, decent Muslims who would like nothing better than to peacefully integrate into the societies in which they live. But there is, uh, regrettably, and perhaps disastrously, very little countervailing influences that are coming from within those communities and from the larger Muslim world that can counteract that. I think at this point, in order to enable further discussion, I will, um, I will rest uh, my case and uh, we'll continue after uh, Jeffrey has his, uh, his own comments. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff? Historians <clears throat> accomplish a great deal when they change the way that we periodize the past. Robert Wistrich has accomplished a great deal in a lethal obsession. Uh, I think there is a comforting, there's been a comforting view that the, the history of anti-Semitism was very long. It culminated uh, in the 1940s uh, in the Holocaust, and it's been diminishing ever since. Um, since 9-11, in this country, um, uh, Bernard Lewis, Paul Berman, Walter LeCur, um, my own work, Ron Rosenbaum, many, many other people have talked about the new anti-Semitism and have cast light, sometimes heat, on its globalization and the, its emergence in the form of radical Islam. The significance of a lethal obsession, the book, is that it's the most comprehensive most well-documented, most cogently and powerfully argued work of historical analysis that explores this last chapter um, in the history of the longest, hist uh, longest hatred, that is the chapter that followed the Holocaust. Um, it's a very significant accomplishment. The title is slightly misleading. The book has 25 chapters um, and 938 pages. 23 of those chapters and 810 of those pages deal with anti-Semitism since 1945. So there's little, from, uh, there's little of from antiquity in the book, enough to make the case that Robert just made. Uh, but primarily, this is a book about the history of anti-Semitism in Europe and in the Middle East and also in Iran uh, since the war. Uh, the core argument is one that, uh, that Robert presented. Uh, let me just uh, uh, repeat it. The history of radical, potentially genocidal anti-Semitism did not end with the defeat of Nazi Germany in 1945. Hitlerism, understood as the hatred of the Jews and of liberal modernity, continued uh, in a transformed cultural and religious context. The terminology of the new post-1945 Jew hatred was no longer predominantly Christian, uh, fascist, or racist. Instead, it drew on neo-Marxist, Islamic, and anti-globalist ideologies. Unreconstructed neo-Nazis have not disappeared, but they are not the main event anymore. Rather, as Robert put it, the center of gravity has changed both from right to left, not the whole left, but some of it, and also from Europe to radical 
Islam. Uh, the um, uh, the book is a a powerful argument and a massive compendium of examples. Uh, the um, uh, and in my I'm going to keep my remarks very very brief, but the um, the the book drives home many points, but one of them is that anti-Semitism in the Middle East was not a result or a product of the foundation of the State of Israel. Rather, anti-Semitism in the Middle East was a key reason for the wars that took place since then and a key reason why a compromise has not been achieved. Uh, the um, uh, Wistrich has very interesting things to say about the Soviet Union. Uh, we are both historians of Nazi Germany. Uh, and Central European history, uh, but Robert um, uh, has a wonderful ear for um, beautiful comments like the following. Um, he reminds us that in September 1971, the Soviet ambassador to the United Nations, Yaakov Malik, replied to the Israeli representative's remarks about Soviet anti-Semitism as follows. Don't stick your long nose into our Soviet garden. And then he accused Zionism of being a racist theory, no different uh, than that of Nazism. The reason that I mention um, Mr. Malik's eloquence is that one of the important points of a lethal obsession is that these ideas, and he presents a great deal of evidence to this argument, are not those of isolated in individuals on the margins of various societies. Malik was the ambassador to, of the Soviet Union to the United Nations. And the same point is one that Wistrich makes when he's talking about Iran. And, a, and he refers to the anti-Semitic rantings of Ahmadinejad not as that of a deranged individual, uh, though clearly they're deranged remarks, but that this represents a consensus of the Iranian leadership. Now, how that looks after June 12th and the protests is another matter. But, he, but in discussing uh, the, uh, the Red-Green Alliance in Britain or the response of the French political elite to violence directed against Jews in France. Uh, uh, Wistrich is, is uh, attempting, uh, or in talking about the Middle East, he is attempting to examine the, the uh, extent to which anti-Semitic attitudes have uh, spread throughout various political elites and uh, establishments. Um, the comments about the French press, uh, whether we're talking about Le Monde or Le Nouvel Observateur, um, are sobering. Not primarily for comments of, of in these distinguished publications of explicit anti-Semitism, but of a reticence to call a spade a spade. Um, uh, Wistrich's comments about the Ayatollah Khomeini and about his cultural and ideological accomplishment are, I, I found particularly interesting. Uh, Khomeini uh, managed to blend fragments of third world Marxist rhetoric with Shiite me messianism uh, uh, and uh, turned Iran into an instrument of a mission, of, of a kind of a global um, uh, missionary sensibility. Uh, the language that uh, is heard on uh, Arab and Iranian television and in the press uh, is grim. Israel is referred to as a rotten and dangerous tumor, a cancer, a festering sore. Um, uh, the, um, uh, and uh, the, um, uh, this is um, uh, in regard to Iran, which is the last several chapters of the book deal with Iran uh, quite extensively. Uh, Robert Wistrich makes the, the obvious but important point that the Iranian government is the first one. And I, here I want to just uh, m make a point. Wistrich is a fine historian. And as a historian, he, has, he, he knows um, uh, that comparisons are not the same thing as establishing identity. So this is a nuanced book and a complex book. And it's not a book that says everything that happened in Europe is being repeated word for word in the Middle East. Um, uh, and in the Persian Gulf. That's not what this book is about. But he does make the point that the Iranian government is the first one since the Nazi regime that has established anti-Semitism as a 
uh, principal uh, ideological dimension of its policy. And the, the last point that I would, that I would make is, <clears throat> I think, one of the most important in the book. Um, this audience is presumably familiar with the, the language and rhetoric of European uh, anti-Semitism, which focused on a mythical uh, uh, subject in history called world Jewry. Uh, and that's old hat, and we are very familiar with that. Uh, Wistrich's argument is that the attack on Israel and the attack on international Zionism has an identical structure to that older form of hatred, uh, an identical structure of conspiratorial thinking, of vast powers attributed to the state of Israel. Uh, uh, and Walter LeCur uh, has reminded us uh, in several of his works that in fact the state of Israel is small and weak um, in a world of very large nations. So in uh, the book is a, uh, uh, well, I'll just read what I wrote. As much as any historian can, Robert Wistrich has documented the fact that radical anti-Semitism has again become a major factor in world politics, that its advocates have mass murder in their hearts and mind, and that they have positions of power from which to make good on their threats. It's a work of singular importance. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, we now uh, have a good uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, time for questions and comments. In Wilson Center tradition, uh, please state your name and affiliation if you like. And again, please wait for the microphone since we're um, webcasting this event live. Questions? Right here. <clears throat> I have a question, maybe. Could you identify yourself, please? Oh, my name is Igor Birman. I have a question, maybe not very delicate. You mentioned Lacour. Walter wrote in his rather recent book that there are 40,000 books on anti-Semitism. It was, reason, it was written in 2006. Let me ask you directly, what new in comparison is 40,000 books wrote in this book? Please tell us, one, two, three. Three would be enough. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know on what basis um, Walter Lacour uh, concluded, did he Google, did he, I'm sure he didn't read them all. Um, you know, first of all, your question is one that I could equally oppose, uh, pose about um, the number of books written about Shakespeare, about Richard Wagner, about the Bible. No, I can assure you that's not the case. But uh, I don't accept the figure, but even if the figure were true, um, I think I can honestly say that I may have read as many books, pamphlets, articles in at least 12 languages. I, I didn't count all the languages, but at least 12. And possibly as many as any single individual that I know has ever read. And they didn't satisfy me, because believe me, I wouldn't waste my time uh, and a decade of my life uh, to go to such lengths to try and get to grips with a phenomenon if I felt that even the essential things have been said. S having said that, I'm not implying that therefore I have solved the riddle of anti-Semitism, that I have said something totally and astoundingly new that I have found an antidote to anti-Semitism, that I believe there is a cure for it, or that my analysis is the only or the correct one. What I do think I have done, and Jeffrey uh, did uh, allude to it right at the beginning, first of all, this is by a long way the most comprehensive book. That's an entirely neutral objective statement I'm making. If you count all the footnotes, it's one th almost 1,200 pages. 
Secondly, although that's not a proof of quality, of course. No, but it's something. Don't dismiss the fact that a comprehensive, exhaustive study of a phenomenon that is global in perspective, not confined to one particular nation, to one narrow period, as in our era of specialization is more and more the case in scholarship, but that seeks to connect together, as far as is humanly possible, all the dots to relate apparently disparate phenomena to discuss how anti-Semitism, for example, at random, I give it examples from the post-war era, how anti-Semitism relates to, these are topics of chapters, how it relates to globalization, how does it relate to multiculturalism, what is, um, uh, what is the contribution, quote-unquote, of the United Nations to the dissemination of uh, anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism and third world ideologies. Um, and these are only a few examples at random. Generally speaking, apart from the odd essay here and there, these subjects are not seriously investigated and analyzed. Then. But the real difficulty is how do they connect? How does one draw and construct what is essentially a mosaic. It's not a linear treatment, it's a thematic treatment in which I go back into the past. Uh, Jeffrey has some uh, problems with antiquity. I understand what he's saying, but in most of the chapters, I go back at least as far into the past as I think is requisite and necessary to understand what is happening now. Um, I think that obviously it's very hard for me, you're almost inviting me to blow my own trumpet, which I'm temperamentally very disinclined to do. So you have to understand my reticence about telling you why I think this is the most important book ever published on the subject. <laughs> Thank you. Jeff, anything to add? It's I think you've said, Yes, all right. Um, there was a question up in the back. Yes, the gentleman in the green sweater. <clears throat> Stanley Kober with the Cato Institute. Um, the implication, it seems to me, what you're saying is that we are on the verge of major war. The references, for example, to Germany coming out of Dreyfus. If you have hatred that is so deeply held and so widely held, can the considerations of deterrence, for example, that we use to prevent war, work against hatred? Thank you. I think this is, um, this is a very serious question. Because if I cast my mind back 70 years ago, um, just over 70 years ago, 1939. The Second World War, historians have explained um, in countless ways, but according to a fairly um, well-established uh, schema of relations between the great powers international diplomacy, the failure of the policy of appeasement, Hitler's determination to expand and to achieve at least hegemony on the European continent and so on and so forth. Although I am not suggesting that the world at the beginning of 2010 is exactly on the brink of a similar constellation because I don't think that Nazi Germany in those conventional, uh, that contemporary Iran in those conventional terms resembles Nazi Germany. Nevertheless, when we examine um, the impact of ideologies and particularly of totalitarian ideologies, and I think that uh, 
radical Islam and jihadism have totalitarian features, then um, one can see a pattern, or as uh, Jeffrey Hurf pointed out, a certain structural resemblance, which does set a lot of alarm bells ringing. Um, I was specially interested in anti-Semitism, so I outline in detail the ways in which a similar structure of irrationality, but an irrationality which has a method uh, in the spirit of uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet, you know, there is method in his madness. There is and there are some frightening, disconcerting um, analogies. And particularly troubling is that I could make the case, and I think in a way I imply it rather than state it categorically, that when it comes to a radical Islam, which is of course a disciparious, um, very varied movement there, you have a state such as Iran, which is a Shia state, um, and therefore the spread of its particular brand of Shiite radicalism um, is at least initially limited more to the Shia minorities in the Middle East, or um, and to some extent there is some overspill into the majority Sunni Arab world, but. When we look not only at the conspiracy theories, but at the aspirations uh, to achieve a world that is ultimately Islamicized, the jihad sets out in its final goal, however far away it may be from that goal, it sets out to conquer the world for Islam. And the peace and harmony in this world will not be achieved. I mean, I have had many discussions on this. It's not only coming from um, a close study, but discussions with Muslims of different kinds, uh, some of whom actually believe this. In the course of making a number of documentary films, I had an opportunity to sit down and explore this in detail and to see that uh, this is taken with deadly seriousness. The idea that um, the jihad will achieve ultimately its goals, that they will rule, however much we may smile, laugh and dismiss it out of hand. They will rule the White House, they will rule Downing Street, they will bring Europe to its knees. You know, one of my chapters is called Welcome to Arabia, Eurabia, sorry. Eurabia. Welcome to Eurabia, which shows how the beginnings of this shift, which may take uh, 30, 40, 50 years to fully implement, are already there. The signs, the signs are there. It doesn't mean everything is fated, predetermined. There are choices, there are policies, there are outcomes that can be changed. But there is that aspiration. We haven't seen that since the days of communism, and even the communists, I think, in retrospect, were more sober and uh, more calculating and with a, a greater sense of reality than, uh, than what we see present in uh, the phenomenon of is Islamism. Uh, and then there's the incalculable. I mean, Iran is one obvious case in point. And it, it's been more complicated by this powerful Surge from below the the aspirations for democracy. Who of us can really know? Even the best intelligence information it seems to me is unable to predict how this will affect the ruling uh, Ayatollahs and Ahmadinejad and his entourage. Will it make them even more intransigent? Will it make an imminent nuclearization of Iran even more dangerous, rather than less so? Uh, which is a possibility. Uh, the world, I think, has entered into a phase to which it's been moving and which I sought to document. Uh, and I'm now even more convinced than I was when I finished 
writing this book, into possibly the most dangerous two years that we could possibly conceive in terms of um, instability is much too mild a word, of, of, of major upheavals, of which even, you know, a country like the United States, which had very much, um, you know, determined the world order through the 1990s and the beginning of this century, w is having enormous difficulty in, in being able to, uh, to handle. Already involved right now, as I speak, in three wars which it cannot <coughs> resolve in Iraq, Afghanistan, and now Pakistan, Le and with Iran waiting in the wings. So Let's war is on the horizon. Let's take a couple more questions. Uh, we have several people. Let me perhaps call on several of you at a time and then. Um, so Avner Cohen is on my list. Avner, right there. <clears throat> Thank you. It was interesting to, to listen to you. Uh, without being Hegelian or Marxist, I couldn't reflect as you were talking about the phenomenon that you cannot deal and you cannot understand, especially historically, the phenomenon of antisemitism without looking, I wouldn't say it's image mirror, but without looking at the image of the Jew itself in its own historical manifestation mm. from early on to the dialectics of Zionism today. So my question today, and as you know, there is a lot on that stuff of the equations, on the uh, Israeli Zionist dialectics of its own identities, as well as events and manifestations of issues of identities. To what extent, and my question is honestly innocent one, to what extent you already to deal with this issue, because dealing with this issue is obviously going reluctantly, perhaps, to locate you within the Israeli ideological, even political spectrum. So to what extent you're also dealing with that side of the, of the, the reality that you deal with? Thank you. The gentleman all the way in the back. Mm. <clears throat> I'm Marty Tolchin. I'm a senior scholar here at the Wilson Center. I uh, first want to thank all of you for an absolutely fascinating discussion. I heard uh, or I read an explanation of European anti-Semitism in the Middle Ages, and I don't know if there's any truth in it. But the explanation was that uh, communities discovered that when they opened their doors to strangers during the time of the plagues, cholera, etc., cetera, uh, that the strangers often brought in these diseases. And of course, the Jews who were <coughs> fleeing prosecution, persecution uh, for centuries uh, were strangers, as were gypsies and other groups. I just want to know if there is any, uh, any truth in that explanation. Thank you. I'm the gentleman up front here, and then we'll go to the panelists, and I have another set of uh, questions. Thank you very much. Edward Joseph with the U.S. Helsinki Commission. Uh, sir, if you permit me, I'm going to do something very unfair to the author of such a monumental work, a work of uh, such great and prodigious uh, scholarship, which is to ask you to take that uh, wisdom and to re reduce it and to address a very practical present conundrum that we face, which uh, that you alluded to, in fact, which is this question of so-called legitimate criticism of Israel masquerading uh, or anti-Semitism masquerading as legitimate criticism of Israel. Do, is there, uh, and I'd address the question to Mr. Herf as well, is there, based on your deep understanding of this issue, is there a template, a way that we can distinguish and, and approach works by, for example, Mearsheimer and Walt, who insist up and down that they are not anti-Semitic, or this member of parliament, uh, British parliament, Galloway, who's now at uh, Gaza, et cetera, manifesting, and et cetera. Is there a way that we can 
approach this question of what is legitimate criticism of Israel and what is anti-Semitism. And it's important because it's often used as a means of rebuking the existence of anti-Semitism. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. Uh, well, I'll try and answer these questions backwards because the last question is always the, the fresher in the memory. Um, you alluded to a number of people who do feature uh, in bit roles, walk-on roles, briefly, in my book, like George Galloway and uh, even the two American university professors that you mentioned. Um, and I did, in fact, listen to an expose of theirs at the Hebrew University. Um, I do not relate to either of them or treat them as anti-Semites. Um, of course, they, in the case of Galloway, are vociferous, vocal anti-Zionists and fiercely anti-Israeli. The way I treat that is in a wider cultural, political context in which they appear. In the case of Galloway, more in, in the course of a chapter about the red-green axis and it is particular manifestations in Britain. In other words, by red-green, I mean a sort of Islamist Marxist axis. Um, a, a, a sort of strange couple, Islamists and Marxists, ostensibly on a whole range of issues, have very little in common. Uh, for instance, uh, attitudes to women are diametrically, diametrically opposed or towards secularism. Uh, and any number of issues, hu human rights, uh, however you want to define that. Nevertheless, they are bedfellows. And part of what drives that alliance is anti-Americanism, anti-Israelism, and a peculiar kind of rhetoric, which while it is not ostensibly and in its own right anti-Semitic, has uh, in effect very often anti Semitic consequences, which one can gauge both in the literature, in the slogans, in demonstrations. I described some of those. I witnessed one of those, a monster demonstration in London, an anti-war demonstration against the Iraq war, I think it was in the year 2003, in which um, uh, members of the party, uh, misnamed party of George Galloway, the Respect Party, because they don't show respect to anyone, um, uh, the kind of slogans that come out of that, um, the language with which Israel in particular is uh, singled out as essentially a genocidal state. Now we could debate, is the description of um, Israel as a genocidal state anti-Semitic or not? I am very reluctant to enter into those kind of debates because clearly the, the, the meaning of anti-Semitism has already shifted by the time we've got to the point where this is such a commonplace formula. Now, you ask, are there clear, neat, uh, even logical, perhaps scientific criteria whereby we could differentiate or we could draw the boundary between um, anti-Zionism, criticism of Israel, and anti-Semitism. I don't think there is such a neat uh, division, except uh, that I would say, with regard to most of the discourse that I've seen in the Arab and Muslim world, whatever boundary there may have been at some point in time, and even on that, I rest an agnostic, uh, has in effect faded. In the West, this is a different story. And one of the reasons that makes it very difficult, uh, why I, I favor a case-by-case -case approach to it, is that, particularly on the left, since World War II, uh, and again, but that existed before the Shoah, there is this anti-fascist tradition and it is still drawn on very much in left-wing and to some extent liberal circles that anti-fascism in some way immunizes you against anti-Semitism. 
If you're an anti-fascist and if you denounce, as many people on the left consistently do, uh, or think they do, the reactionary forces of militarism, of fascism, of racism around the world, you cannot be anti-Semitic per definition. And I show more by examples throughout my book how false, in fact, this assumption can be. Uh, and, and, and I leave the reader to decide, are the people who are so convinced in their own self-righteousness that they truly are anti-racist and anti-fascist and therefore cannot be anti-Semitic, are they the victims of their own self-delusions? Are they in fact cynical, manipulating opportunists? Um, what is going on? But I try to show more through examples that this is not what it seems. Um, and one of the important points in the discussion, particularly in Europe, this is relevant, but I think also in universities here in the United States is becoming increasingly a very important issue, is that uh, we have people who are self-proclaimed and self-righteous, anti-racist, who are in the forefront of stigmatizing, and I, I think this word of stigma, of attaching a stigma to a group or to a state or to a people, as is happening in, in the case of Israel in particular, that this is one of the, one of the hallmarks. And this is something that you observe more and more. And it has, it has cre created its own snowball effect. It's, it's become something of a steamroller, a very intimidatory uh, sort of discussion and discourse. Um, I was asked a question uh, uh, by Avner Cohen, I think. Yes? Um, you know there are no innocent questions. I think you said it was an innocent question. Uh, <laughs> no, no, there are no innocent questions. I'm saying that as a general proposition, slightly tongue-in-cheek. Um, do I factor in, do I take into account uh, my interpretation of your question, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're asking me, do I in some sense consider, would I be prepared to consider that, for example, Israel's own policies, its behavior, its actions, are the main, or at least in part, catalyst of many of the anti-Semitic uh, responses that I document. Yes, well, you know, uh, I assume you're from Israel, and that um, therefore, like me, you're very familiar with the daily political uh, discourse in Israel, where there are people of some importance, especially in the intellectual milieu, the academic milieu, who, if you raise, I mean, it's happened to me many times, you raise the issue of anti-Semitism, what do they say? Occupation, occupation, occupation. And you, by raising the issue, I have to say it's one of the most exasperating things I have to deal with on a daily basis. The mere fact of raising the issue, the implication is already that you wish to finesse or to avoid the key issue, which is Israel and its policies. And in the wider world, you hear today, it's extremely fashionable. It's almost a knee-jerk reaction to hear pe people say, as soon as anti-Semitism is mentioned, ah, this is a Zionist ploy. This is an Israeli card. This is a trick. We talk about justice for the Palestinians, we talk about uh, the oppression uh, of Israel, the occupation and so on, and they, meaning the Israelis, the Zionists, the pro-Zionists, etc., etc., they come and say anti-Semitism and they try to silence, to silence all justified criticism by raising it. Now, I think, honestly, I have to tell you, no, 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 no I'm, I'm taking it a stage further because it's so common.
It's, I'm not saying you were saying that. You were not saying that. But there are a lot of people that take it to that point. And all I want to say to you is, of course I've considered it, and indeed I discuss it at considerable length in my book. So much so that I come to the conclusion that one of the most sophisticated um, and, if you like, unspoken, tacit, latent examples of anti-Semitism today is to call anti-Semitism a card that unknown persons, because they rarely mention any names, raise in order to avoid justified criticism of Israel. I can tell you, as far as I'm concerned, such a thought not only is completely alien to me, but is totally absurd. That there are individuals who may indeed practice this is possible. I personally have not met them. I don't dismiss the possibility. But I find it completely irrelevant, at least to my own project or endeavor as a scholar. But it exists. It's out there. Should, should we bring Jeff, Jeff into this? Discussion? Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a, a couple points. Um, the wonderful thing about a book, uh, big ones and smaller ones, is that you can read them in the privacy of your home and digest and think about the evidence that's in them. And so this is a plea to... Um, uh, address the evidence that Wistrich uh, presents at great length. Uh, I, I, Robert Wistrich and I do share a bias. It's a very strong bias. It's a bias of intellectual and cultural historians. And it is that when somebody stands up in public and says that the earth is flat or that the Jews started the war in Iraq, um, uh, or that uh, the state of Israel is spreading AIDS uh, in the occupied territories. Our first reaction is not to say, this is preposterous and nobody could possibly believe such rubbish. Our first reaction is to say, as historians, we have studied people in the past who believed very strange things, and there is no methodological reason whatsoever to assume that people who say such things don't believe them. So that's the bias that Wistrich and I share. And you can agree or disagree with either of us, but please address the evidence. Give the evidence a chance. Neither of us are dogmatists. We're historians. You asked about a template. Um, here's a few suggestions. Whenever somebody makes an argument that's based on a conspiracy theory, uh, that should be regarded as ridiculous and not worthy of um, uh, attention in respectable company. Second, when people make disproportionate criticisms, when they express rage and indignation about the treatment of Palestinians in the occupied territories, but they say nothing at all when the Passover Seder is blown up, or when the volleyball match in Pakistan is blown up, um, or uh, when the London subway or the Madrid subway or on and on and on, when they somehow cannot find the words, when the level of indignation and eloquence just escapes them, then you know you're dealing with a dishonest person. You know you're dealing with a person who's motivated by hatred and not by attempting to empirically assess what's actually going on. And third, I would raise this for the Helsinki Commission and I'd raise this for everyone who is involved in the human rights community. My Perhaps my ears have missed something in the last 10 years, but I don't recall people in human rights organizations calling suicide bombers war criminals. I don't recall people discussing blowing up a volleyball match as a crime against humanity. I haven't heard that. I haven't heard people in the human rights community, other than Erwin Cutler, uh, call on uh, the United Nations or the Hague court to haul Ahmadinejad into court for incitement to genocide, because according to the UN Genocide Convention of 1951, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is guilty of incitement to mass murder. And that's a crime uh, in the Genocide Convention. I haven't heard the human rights community say those things. So when the Helsinki Commission and the various human rights organizations here in Washington begin calling these people what they are, war criminals, who kill innocent people for no reason whatsoever, when that happens, then I'll be willing to listen to what they have to say about Israeli behavior in the occupied uh, territories. 
I think the we still owe the gentleman in the back um, a response to his question, but let me take a couple of additional, bring in a couple of additional uh, perspectives and voices. Um, yes, to the left there, Mike Hartzell. Uh, my name is Mike Haltzell. I'm at Johns Hopkins SICE, and actually I'm one of your predecessors here as uh, Director of West European Studies. Uh, terrific presentations, um, unrelievedly uh, negative, I would think, and, and it's a negative subject, but I would say pessimistic. Um, you're absolutely right that the locus of uh, anti-Semitism has shifted from the Christian world to the Islamic world, and that's largely because the Islamic world has gone in a negative direction, but it's also a testament to the fact that there's been progress uh, in Europe and in the United States, North America and elsewhere, uh, majority Christian societies with regard to uh, views of Jews and a lessening of anti-Semitism. I guess what I would say, I'm not asking, and, and I'm not trying to say that we can expect Iran to become uh, Finland or, or Denmark tomorrow morning, but my question is simply, can't we at least pull some of the positive um, cases where uh, countries successfully combated uh, anti-Semitism, often murderous anti-Semitism, and at least have some, you know, projected into the 21st century. Give me about 30 more seconds and I'll tell you what I mean. Obviously, uh, w with regard to Europe, you had certain cases, Bulgaria, where the socioeconomic profile of the Jews was almost identical to the Christian Bulgarians. You had rulers in, in, in you had kings, you had, you had a, a, a marshal in Finland, Monerheim. In the United States, you had a Hubert Humphrey single-handedly cleaning up the mess of anti-Semitism in the upper Midwest, the Anti-Defamation anti League. I have to say that the uh, OSCE, Jeff, has done uh, terrific work, and it's a regional organization of the UN uh, in combating anti-Semitism. Okay, even today, a Muslim plurality country in Europe, Bosnia and Herzegovina, has a Jewish foreign minister. They have complained at the meetings of the Organization of the Islamic Conference against suicide bombings. I mean, is there, is there no ray of light whatsoever to look at? Thank you. Um, the gentleman, the center in the with the gray jacket there. Make sure that please make sure the microphone is actually on. I'm is it on? Okay. Yes. Yeah. My name is Tom Getman. Um, I served in Israel and Palestine for five years, and then in Geneva for seven. And uh, I want to say thank you, Professor. Uh, your your colleagues at the university gave me great comfort a lot of the time when I was living with some of the conundrums. And of the five to eight million dollars a year that I was responsible for putting into water projects and clinics, ag, ag projects in the West Bank and Gaza are now all destroyed. And that's not being unfairly critical of Israel. It just leads me to say, as a person from a Jewish background who went to Israel because of love for Israel and desire to make sure that I could do my part that it survived, um, how do we, to turn the Helsinki question around a little bit, how do we who care and don't want to be called anti-Semite or self-hating Jews uh, deal with um, legitimate concerns without falling into this mess? And when I was in the Human Rights Commission and Council in Geneva, I had lovely conversations with my Jewish colleagues as I was representative of the NGOs. Uh, but when we were on the floor of the commission and tried to raise anything legitimately, right away it devolved into this kind of charge. So I take Pro Professor Herf's uh, three points. I've applied them to my own analysis and experience. This is the beauty of bringing operational people to this room and still have the question, how do we do this out of love for Israel when there are legitimate things that we need to raise because a lot of Muslim families that used to love Jews don't anymore. Thank you. Two more questions. Uh, the gentleman in the light blue shirt, just in front of Dr. Hatzel. Yeah. My name is Gershon Greenberg. Uh, Robert, I have a specific question about uh, you're recalibrating uh, the balance between Christianity and Islam uh, after the war. 
Uh, could you uh, say, uh, tell us where you would um, inject uh, fundamentalist uh, Christianity into that uh, rebalancing insofar as uh, the dispensational mythic structure uh, is um, unremittently um, anti judaic and anticipating uh, the um, uh, destruction of the Jewish people. And I ask uh, in that connection, uh, you've seen patterns of various streams come together of anti Semitism, some of Christianity coming together with Nazism in World War II. Is it conceivable? that the anti-Semitism in the Islamic world can serve as a catalyst for bringing down that myth of Jewish destruction in Pentecostalism uh, down to earth. Thank you. And if you can just pass the microphone right behind you to Dr. Reich, and then last question to Dr. Reich. Um, this is, I'm Walter Reich uh, from George Washington University and the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, and thank you very much, Professor Wistrich, and also uh, Professor Herf. Um, I happen to share not only your analysis historically, your historical analysis, and Professor Herf, your motivational analysis, um, but also your, your common sense of alarm regarding um, the language intentions uh, and motivations occurring in the Muslim world regarding Jews. Um, in fact, probably my alarm is even greater than yours. Um, you wrote a very large book, and we know the fate of large books. Uh, they uh, are um, um, awesome and uh, important and uh, not always um, bestsellers. Um, you raise a very, very important voice and have written a very, very important book. Uh, but there are many who have uh, expressed alarm. Uh, and there are not many, I think, who've um, echoed that alarm. I think the outcome of this could well be ca quite catastrophic, even more catastrophic uh, than occurred 60 and 70 years ago. Uh, and my question is, why? Has there been such silence? Thank you. Would you like uh, to ask a question that I, why don't you go ahead and we'll take that yes, too. Yes, thank you. Um, this is with regard to Iran. I wonder what you think the future of the Jewish community is there. There have been statements by Iranians that no, we're not anti-Jewish, we're just anti-Zionist. And the community is something like 20,000. Is there any hope for their survival? Are we looking at an aliyah like the various operations that were undertaken for other countries? Um, mm -hmm. Can that community continue? Thank you. You now have the awesome task of answering these questions in five minutes <laughs> that we have left. OK, I'll try and go as fast as I can. Um, going backwards, regarding the Jews of Iran, I, w I want to preface it with one short uh, statement for the sake of perspective. Until 1979, until the Iranian revolution that created the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Jews of Iran had experienced something of a golden age. The 1960s and 70s under the Shah of Iran were probably the best times that the Jews of Iran had ever known. And uh, as a matter of fact, for Iranian society as a whole, if people had said, which is the society in the Middle East that appears to be moving, if we exclude Turkey for the moment, appears to be moving the closest towards a Western, westernized modernity, probably one would have had to say Iran. So uh, it's certainly nothing that is inherent or uh, uh, belongs to the, either the character of the Iranian people or the nature of that society per se. But it is the hijacking uh, of that society by a, a really uh, pernicious uh, totalitarian uh, ideology that has... Um, now, only now, become apparent to more and more people, although I'm not quite sure the President of the United States has fully got the message. Uh, 
um, is deeply unpopular uh, it, with its own uh, people. Um, the future of the Jews of Iran is uh, obviously very problematic. Um, there are, curiously enough, some Iranian Jews who have done well. Um, the regime has what at first glance looks like a schizophrenic attitude in these matters. It appears very concerned to show a facade of normality that it treats the Jewish community uh, reasonably well in terms of catering to its religious needs, its communal needs, while of course um, at the same time it's quite clear, the rules of the game are clear to the Iranian Jews themselves. I mean, when Roger Cohen wrote his pieces uh, in the New York Times after going to Iran and speaking to a number of Iranian Jews, he just forgot the minor point that would have been familiar to people who visited uh, the, uh, you know, communist societies uh, in an earlier period, uh, how unreliable and how carefully one needs to uh, reflect on what people say to you in such situations. They are in effect hostages to fortune. If there would be a major military confrontation between Israel and Iran, if the regime would be about to fall, if there were things that we can't quite, you know, predict at this moment, I don't think the future of the Jews of Iran would be rosy at all. But there is a curious difference, you know, between the propaganda of the regime and what it broadcasts to the Arab world, to the outside world, um, and its actual treatment of its own uh, Jewish citizens. But no, I would say that no self-respecting Iranian Jew could possibly want to live in that society, uh, but that's just my, uh, my, my take on it. Uh, the Holocaust denial is, of course, a very painful aspect for Iranian Jews. That is something they draw the line at. I mean, Holocaust denial is virtually a state doctrine in Iran. That is something totally unprecedented uh, in the post-war era. I was asked some very tough questions. Uh, there was a question about the apocalypse, so to speak. Christianity, Islam, the ap I, I deal with that very, very extensively in my book. I don't think there is, when you explore it uh, really in depth, that much in common between Christian versions of the apocalypse, say in fundamentalist Christianity today, which you know more about than I do, um, that it has the same slant. Use the words of the destruction of the Jewish people. I don't really see it that way. Uh, well, I, I have spoken to many fundamentalists. I've read some of their literature. I take their support for Israel um, in a positive way. I'm, of course, am aware of the theology uh, behind it, but I don't see any parallel with the Muslim apocalyptic trends, which really see the destruction of Israel as um, an absolutely indispensable, necessary prologue to the triumph of Islam around the world. You might say, well, there is a parallel. There was a parallel in the past. Such trends in the Christian world Really, one could draw some, uh, some kind of analogy. I do want to make one very briefly. In, you have to read the book to see this. That it's a big point that extreme forms, genocidal forms of anti-Semitism are often related to apocalyptic strands within some of the movements that we've been discussing. And Nazism itself was a very good example of that. Um, and that needs to be noted because we are in an age where, where uh, apocalypse is almost at every corner. And it's behind us and it's below us and it, it's broadcast to us. The end of the world is coming in 2012, if you didn't know. And that's not just Nostradamus, it's apparently Mayan prophecies of the end of civilization. Um, there are hundreds of things like that in the atmosphere. And then there's the real world and the event which seem to be driving us in a direction that, um, I'm sorry about the element of gloom here because there was a gentleman asking for rays of light. But, uh, but I'm talking about what is the real world. Now, 
coming to your ray of light um, may surprise you to know that small consolation perhaps for you but for me it was important that I often felt in the course of writing this that like I was in a very very long tunnel and I was wondering if the light would ever appear at the end which went beyond would I finish the book to whether there'd be any real light at the end of it um, and you know you probably won't believe this but I am optimistic <laughs> it may go against everything I've said here tonight everything that Jeffrey has said um, and it's certainly not optimism in the short term because I as I said before I think we have to get through these next two years perhaps three years an extremely dangerous period in the history of the world and of course I wonder about my own country and how Israel will survive but I do believe that's belief or we're into uh, I guess the realm beyond rational discussion of course I believe in the eternity of Israel I don't think I could have written this book if I didn't because I'm not a pessimist and without some kind of faith uh, it's very hard to face up to all these things even if one keeps one's own personal beliefs out of it you know in in course of the analysis I think one can analyze things in the way I've suggested and yet remain not only an optimist but more importantly that one can be galvanized to act and to make choices which may in effect help in concert with many others to avert the worst uh, uh, the worst consequences um, and I think that was wasn't that the prophetic role isn't that what Israel gave as a legacy to the whole of of the world more than any other nation I would even hazard to say that that is the power of, of prophecy is that it galvanizes not that it's a prediction in the scientific sense so uh, there was one other uh, there were s several questions but what do we do all I want to say about that is I'm certainly not going to suggest to you now in a kind of superficial sweeping way uh, something that I didn't even attempt to do in the book which is to provide an answer although all of us looking for an answer but I must point out that in seven eight years of having been at so many gatherings conferences organizations such as the one mentioned here tonight the OSCE the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe uh, different parliaments Canada UK uh, French uh, you know politicians uh, the US State Department I could go down a long list of people that I've discussed the practicalities of there's a lot of goodwill a lot of um, awareness a lot of willingness of governments particularly in the Western world to do something to try and do something to be seen to do something to organize parliamentary inquiries, to uh, monitor, to uh, develop best practices schemes for different countries. Um, and what I cannot help but observe is that despite relative goodwill, despite the fact that even on the very sensitive and touchy question of Israel, most Western governments today whatever they may say for public consumption do understand the position uh, and that they are not they're not anti-Israel nevertheless none of this has made the slightest difference not even the smallest dent in my opinion in the graph of anti-semitism in its resonance in its power um, Governments do not control this. That doesn't mean they should stop trying or that there is nothing they can do, but they do not control the situation. And, and we need to know that and take that as a further reason to galvanize ourselves and our energy because the salvation will not come from governments. hope I haven't trod on any toes there. Thank you very much. I have to bring this panel to conclusion, but not without
thanking Dr. Wistrich and Dr. Herf for um, very rich, stimulating presentations. Thank you for bringing in um, different questions, perspectives, comments. Thank you finally also to um, my staff, in particular Christina Terzieva in the back who helped set up this meeting. Um, we're adjourned. Thank you for coming. I hope to see you again soon at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Thank you. Thank you.